Hello and welcome to this podcast for genetics. In this podcast, we're going to focus on gene cloning. And as our example, we're going to talk about insulin. We've talked about that in class before, so I think it's an appropriate one to talk about. And so with gene cloning, what we're going to do is we're going to take the human insulin gene and then we're going to take a bacterial plasmid and we are also going to call this a vector. We'll use those terms interchangeably or sometimes I might call it a plasmid vector. And then by combining these together in a special way that we'll talk about in a moment, we'll have this vector with the insulin gene inside it. And then we'll place this vector with him human insulin in it into a bacterial cell. Or a yeast cell or some other kind of cell. Within these cells they will mass produce these plasmids containing the human insulin so that we have many copies of this. And then at that point we can isolate the protein insulin. In class, or rather in lab, you will do a very similar process but instead of isolating a protein from it, you'll sequence the gene. What I'd like to be able to do is leave this top half up here throughout the podcast and below here describe the next steps in detail. There are several ways that we could get this human insulin gene, but the most common way is to use PCR. And using PCR we will get multiple copies of the DNA. And to be accurate, I should draw this as a double strand it being DNA. There should be two strands here. Now the next job is to take this amplified copy of human insulin and place it into this plasmid vector. Now there's nothing magical about this DNA here that's going to automatically insert it into the plasmid. Researchers take advantage of one of the greatest discoveries in molecular biology and these are called restriction enzymes. Now these restriction enzymes are originally found in bacteria. And I'm drawing this rather large here. And what these restriction enzymes do is they protect the bacterium against viruses. So if we have a virus here that's placing its DNA in here inside of the bacterium and will ultimately try to destroy the bacterium. What the bacteria will do is make these restriction enzymes. And these restriction enzymes will cut the DNA and chop it up. By chopping up the DNA, the virus is ineffective at killing the bacterial cell. So what are these restriction enzymes? Restriction enzymes have a specific sequence of DNA that they recognize. There are hundreds of these restriction enzymes. Here are a few examples. SAL1, BAM, H1, and ECHO R1. These are just different enzymes that will chop the DNA up and they do so in a very specific manner, meaning that SAL1 may recognize a specific sequence here, but BAMH1 would recognize this sequence and same thing with ECHO R1. In this way, bacterial cells can fight off a variety of viral infections. Scientists have isolated these restriction enzymes and they know the sequence that they recognize and so we take advantage of that when we clone this gene into this plasmid. So let's talk about how we're going to do that. And so let's draw the second strand of this plasmid. And what researchers have done is they have engineered very specific restriction enzymes, enzyme sites, I should say, the DNA sequence that binds here. And for our purposes, let's pick SAL1. Let's say right here is a sequence that SAL1 will bind to and cut. When it cuts here, it will leave a very characteristic overhang. This SAL1 cut site and this SAL1 cut site could come back together or we could place in here another sequence of DNA that was also cut with SAL1. So that's what we do with gene cloning. When we make these human insulin genes here or any gene, but in this case human insulin, we engineer them in such a way that they contain the sequences at the end 
specific for a restriction enzyme. In this case, the specific enzyme will be SAL1. So we cut the plasmid with SAL1, and then we cut the human insulin with SAL1. So when we cut the human insulin PCR product with SAL1, we'll end up with something that would look like this. Also with the sequence specific for SAL1 that was just cut on both ends. These now will match up perfectly with these overhangs from the vector that was digested because they were both cut with SAL1. Now, if this would have been cut, say, with BAMH1 or ECHO R1 or one of the other hundreds of restriction enzymes, this would not work. It only works if you use the same restriction enzyme. Now, I want to mention one other thing here because as I showed this insulin PCR product coming in here and binding to this vector, I left something out. It doesn't just magically seal in here and create these bonds to unite the PCR product with this vector. Researchers will use DNA ligase, the same DNA ligase that our cells use during DNA replication. So this DNA ligase will come along here and seal these ends so that it is firmly linked inside of this vector. Now remember I said that when we cut the plasmid with SAL1, we had something that looked like this. And I mentioned that it's also possible that this end and this end could ligate together, re-ligate together. You cut it and now it comes back together. There are a lot of different things we can do to prevent this from happening, but for the purpose of this class, let's just assume that this could happen in which case you would get the reformed plasmid vector. Now how are we going to be able to tell the difference between these? Because we only want plasmids that have this insulin gene in it. We don't want this. This will not make insulin protein like we want, only this will. One of the ways that we can do this, there's a few ways, but let's talk about one. We could run this on an agarose gel. And what we do is we make this gel and we place it in an electrical field so that the positive is down here and the negative is up here. We then take these plasmids and we'll have to cut them so they can move down these wells appropriately and you'll talk more about that in lab. But for our purposes, let's just say that we're going to take this plasmid, and we'll call it one, and this one two, and we're going to put that plasmid here in lane one and this plasmid here in lane two. In this well, we're going to put a molecular ladder. Molecular ladders have fragments of DNA in them that are of known sequences, sequence lengths. So when you run this gel here, small DNA will be down here. So maybe it's 500 bases. Maybe this one's 750. Maybe this one's 1000. Maybe this one's 1500 nucleotides long. So ask yourself, when we run these in this lane here, these two lanes here, which one will be heavier and which one will be lighter. By looking at this, we would predict that this plasmid one with the insulin gene in it will be heavier. All right, so now we're gonna put our plasmids in lane one and two. And let's say the plasmid without the insulin gene in it is 750 nucleotides long. And the plasmid with the insulin gene in it is 1250 base pairs long. When you run these on the gel, this one here should migrate to about right here. Two should migrate to about here. And so by running your clone samples on gels, you can determine which ones have your insert because they're gonna be the heavier ones. Now let's talk a little bit about why they run in this way. The lighter ones are not as impeded as they move through this gel structure. So they migrate faster. The heavier ones, such as this band here, they migrate slower because they are larger and they don't have as easy enough time going through the gel structure. So why is it that they move towards the positive and not the negative? Remember, all this DNA, because of the structure of DNA, has a lot of phosphate groups which are negatively charged. Because of that, DNA is negatively charged, so it's going to move towards the positive electrode and away from the negative electrode. So they should always move in this direction. How fast they move, is dependent upon their size. All right, now that we're confident we have the correct plasmid here, we can now place it inside of a bacterial cell. So we're at this step here, where we're gonna take this plasmid and place it inside of the cell. Okay, so now we can take this verified 
plasmid with the insulin gene in it and place it inside of a host. It could be E. coli, it could be a yeast cell. Let's use a bacterial cell, though the process is very similar if we were to add it to a yeast cell. So how is it we're going to get this plasmid inside of this E. coli cell? We're going to use the process of transformation. Very similar to the process of transformation we talked about when we talked about horizontal gene transfer in bacteria. Remember with transformation in bacteria, a bacterial cell will import a random piece of DNA that's in the environment. And that's exactly what's going to happen here. Now this plasma isn't going to automatically go inside here. There's a few things we could do to make it more efficient for this plasma to move into the E. coli cell. There are two general ways to do this. One is a chemical way and one is an electrical way, which we will call electroporation. Both processes result in the same product. The chemical method involves treating the E. coli cells or other bacterial cells with various chemicals to make the bacterial cell permeable to allow the transfer of the plasmid inside of the E. coli cell. Electroporation is very similar, but instead of using chemicals, we zap it with electricity. And as it's being zapped with electricity, it opens up the cell wall, allowing the DNA to move in. Either method results in an E. coli with the plasmid containing insulin inside of it. We then grow this bacterial cell containing the insulin plasmid in media. And this media contains an antibiotic called ampicillin. And I want to explain why it has ampicillin in it, because that's an important concept as we move forward. This plasmid up here, I talked about the restriction site, but it has a few other things in it as well. There is a gene here that codes for ampicillin resistance. This way, the only bacteria that survive will contain this plasmid that not only has insulin in it now, but has the ampicillin resistance gene. That way, if any of these bacterial cells happen to lose this plasmid and look like this with no plasmid in it, in media that contains ampicillin, this bacteria will die. And that's what you want to happen because you only want bacteria cells that contain the plasmid that we're interested in. We only want these bacteria to survive. Again, they survive because in addition to having the insulin gene in them, they have this ampicillin resistance gene that will make a protein to help this bacteria survive in the presence of ampicillin. Now that we have a large supply of bacteria containing this plasmid, we can do one of several things. In lab, what you will do is you will sequence the segment of DNA that you placed in there. In lab, we're not working with insulin, you're working with something else, but you could sequence this, whatever it is that you put in there. Or, as I've suggested here, we could make protein, or in this case, insulin. The gene we placed in here, we could have this gene make the protein, insulin, so that we can mass produce insulin inside of this flask that's growing them. However, there is one more thing I need to add to this plasmid in order to make sure it makes insulin. And I didn't mention it before because I didn't want so much on this plasmid that it became confusing. Where you're going to put the insulin gene right before it on this plasmid is a promoter. P-R-O-M-O-T-E-R, -E promoter. Promoters we'll learn about next week. And promoters are what's important to activate this gene. Without the promoter, this gene, gene, insulin in this case, won't make a protein. So you need the promoter there. You also have to have a terminator so that it knows when to stop making the messenger RNA that will then go on to make the protein. We'll talk more about promoters and terminators soon. But for now, what I would like you to know is that if you're going to make a protein from this plasmid vector, you have to have a promoter and you have to have a terminator sequence so that E. coli, when it starts making protein, knows where to make the protein from. Otherwise, this whole plasma is just a, a ring of nucleotides that mean really nothing to it. So to review, plasmid vectors contain a restriction site here where you're going to put the insulin gene. They contain an ampicillin resistance gene that will allow only the bacterial cells to survive that have the plasmid because of the ampicillin resistance. And then if you're going to make the protein from the insulin gene, you have to have the promoter sequence and the terminator sequence 
so that the bacterial cell knows when to begin and stop making messenger RNA that will then be turned into proteins. So to quickly review, the process of gene cloning involves taking a gene you want to clone, you want to make more copies of, placing it inside of a plasmid vector, verifying that it's in there, then transforming it into a cell like E. coli or yeast, and then expressing that vector in order to make the protein of interest. Okay, that's all I have for this podcast. If you have any questions at all, please let me know. If not, I'll see you in class. Bye.